Warning, this episode may contain some or all of the following. Adult topics, adult language. Listener discretion is advised. Some topics or language may be offensive or triggering to some audience members. Welcome to Southern Storyteller. I'm Holly. I'll be your host. Welcome to Southern Storyteller. I'm Holly. This episode, we're going to continue talking about the George Floyd case, which I named Excessive Force, the Death of George Floyd. Okay, this is... A little telling of the timeline as I understand it, as well as the aftermath and how everything has evolved and more people becoming aware of the oppression people of color have suffered for hundreds of years. This is not a new thing. Here recently, no, this this has been going on. For centuries, this is not a new thing. Where the police come in, there's this blue wall of silence. You don't... Well, how I... How I understand it is you don't talk about other cops even if you don't agree with them. It's like a taboo. You do not cross that blue wall of silence. You just don't do it. And in this case, because of the blue wall of of silence, another person died. And he died on the city street with onlookers and and the fellow officers of the guy who did it. Well, the main guy. Let's be real. They all four were involved. But because they were afraid of him, nobody you know, cross that line of trying to be insubordinate. So, anyway, here are the subjects, or suspects. Uh, We have the two rookies, Thomas Lane and J. Alexander Kung. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. They had only been uh, off of probation for just a couple of shifts so, they really were looking to Derek Chauvin, I think is how you pronounce his name. Sometimes I refer to him as Bully Cop. They looked to him for direction because not only was he the senior officer on the scene, he was also the training officers of these two other guys. And then, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, bur- I'm gonna butcher this name. Tao... Thou? I'm sorry. You know, he, he was on the job a couple, of, a couple of years, and he had gotten in trouble, and he had actually got put back on full duty, from what I understand. So, Chauvin is an, like a 19-year veteran on the force, so he should have known better. He's supposed to set the example to the others in what to do and what not to do. He... Sure, show the world of what you're not supposed to do. Let's be real. Okay. So, on the evening of May 25th, 2020. Here's the timeline. George Floyd uh, goes to Cup Foods in Minneapolis to buy a pack of cigarettes. The store clerk accuses him of purchasing them with a counterfeit $20 bill. He even goes outside to confront Mr. Floyd to either give him the, you know, good money instead of fake money or just return the cigarettes. According to this guy, George refuses, probably stating, I don't know, this is alleged, probably stating that he, you know, that wasn't no fake bill, you know, whatever. So, the clerk goes inside, 
and calls the police and reports like a forgery in progress or paying with a fake bill. Alleged fake bill. So, Lane and his partner, Kung, show up. They go and talk to the people in the store, and they point out Mr. Floyd, who is still there, and they go and just arrest him. They don't, like, go to question him. They don't do anything. They just assume the worst, that he's, like, passing fake bills. Now, this is alleged and my opinion, okay? That he's out passing fake bills left and right. You know, typical black stereotypes, which is sad because Kung is not a white guy. And also, in my opinion, if Mr. Floyd knew the bill was a fake bill, why was he hanging out? Why was he just hanging out at the scene of an alleged crime? I don't, I don't know who would do that. Who would go, yeah, I'm going to wait. And considering all of the history that he himself has endured of, you know, how police, you know, how, how police target African American males. I mean, I mean, it's in his story and I, and I will, I will read that in a little bit. So, Lane uh, apparently goes over to arrest Floyd. At first, he, like, resists. And then he's like, no, you're under arrest, and blah, blah, blah. And then he gives in. He don't fight anymore. He don't resist anymore. And Lane even states this at his bail hearing. Which I'll, I'll get to that in a second, too. Uh, Mr. Floyd had two other individuals with him that night. Because this happened about 8 p.m. And within an hour and a half, he wouldn't be with us anymore. So, uh, they handcuffed Mr. Floyd. And they sit him on the ground against the wall of the restaurant. And he says, thank you, man. He was calm. Then the park officer, which I don't know if he has been named or not, but he just watches the other two and the vehicle to make sure nothing happens. They pass him some sort of paper in a plastic, I, I, I guess, evidence bag. I don't know. Maybe that was the 20. I don't know. Which the police have been kind of mum on this $20 bill, too. Was it real? Was it fake? Did he know that it was fake? Did he, did he think it was real? I think he thought it was real. Okay. So they get Floyd up. Mr. Floyd up. They get him up. And they cross the road where their car is parked in front of Cup Foods. Now, he's kind of, he kind of stumbles, he stiffens up, and, you know, they, they take it in the moment as he's, like, resisting, but he's having, he's having some issues here. And when they get him to the police car, to put him in the police car, he says, I'm claustrophobic. I'm not resisting arrest. I'm just claustrophobic. I, you know, probably has a fear of being in the back seat of a police car. Let's be real here. Um, he stiffens, falling to the ground. He states, I'm not resisting. I'm just claustrophobic. That's when Chauvin and Tao, that's when they arrive. Chauvin, or sometimes I will call him bully cop. He takes over the scene. So, uh, Mr. Floyd is stating, I am claustrophobic. So, Chauvin grabs him 
out of the police car and like shoves him to the ground. I mean, this has ex this has accelerated quickly over a possible fake twenty dollar bill. I mean, this the handling of him so far is not warranted. It wasn't a violent crime. He wasn't being violent. He's having some issues, and he's claustrophobic, and he's surrounded by white people. If I was in his shoes, I would be terrified too. So they get him to the, you know, there he's on the ground now. Wayne is holding his legs. Coon is holding onto his back and pressing down. Tao looks confused at times, but he paces back and forth. trying to be a barricade between the police officers and the crowd that is growing. And of course, we all know what Chauvin is doing at this point. Chauvin Chauvin. We all know what he's doing by now. So there he is. He is pinned to the pavement with three full-grown adult males on his back, leg, and his neck. All this time, he's handcuffed. He's not fighting. He's not fighting with these people. They are not in any danger from Mr. Floyd. I've always thought, get them off of the pavement, get them off of their chest as soon as, as soon as possible. Don't sit on him for 20 minutes, you know? I know it was 10, but he's 100% subdued. He's vulnerable and no danger to anybody. He's in distress, he's in pain, and he is in shock. He's pleading for his life. He's pleading just to be able to breathe. You can hear Tao say, Oh, he's okay because he can talk. No, you can, you can be suffocating to death and still be able to talk. Now, this is also my opinion. There's, there's part of this video where Chauvin is looking at the crowd, relishing at this attention and the domination of this man underneath him. I mean, you can just tell he's enjoying this. He is really enjoying this. Okay, the crowd is growing in hysteria as uh, Floyd's pleas grow weaker and weaker. The crowd, they know. They know that even though they're more, they have more members than the police do, but they know that they know that they can turn on them as easily as they did Mr. Floyd. So they stay back. Even though they know that. They try to inch closer to see if they can get Chauvin to get off of him. So, as this goes on, as the seconds tick on, as they grow closer, he actually gets his mace out and points it at the crowd. And, obviously, they jump back. Now, it's been speculated that when he has put it, when Chauvin is putting his hand into his pocket, that he's not just doing that in a condescending way. Look what I can do. You know, look what I can do. He's doing that where he can actually press harder onto his thigh where that will go, that, you know, that will increase the pain. That will increase the torture. Okay, that video that has been shown worldwide was shot by a lady by the name of Darnella Frazier. And I recently saw an interview with her where she is so emotional and you can just tell that she is suffering from sort some, some version of PTSD just from being a witness to that, which I, I really get that. 
And I believe if it wasn't for her showing the world of how monstrous, especially Chauvin was that day, I don't think they would have been charged. I think it would have been another, well, he was just resisting arrest and we had to do what we were going to do. You know, I don't, mm -mm. no, 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 no. All four of the officers were fired the, the next day. By Friday, Chauvin was charged with third-degree murder and second-degree manslaughter. After a series of protests, these charges were upgraded as well. Then the other three were charged and arrested. Mr. Gray, one of the attorneys... His name is Earl Gray. That's uh, Lane's lawyer. Which, if you don't know what Earl Gray is, that's a T. I thought that was weird. But here nor there. So they're charged, they're mainly charged with conspiracy to commit murder. I think they may also be looking at civil rights charges. I'm not sure about that. Okay, Mr. Gray, this is where I was getting at. Mr. Gray, the attorney for Mr. Lane. Mr. Lane had allegedly called on Chauvin to roll Floyd over. That he may uh, be having some sort of a medical issue. Chauvin just refused. He ignored everybody in saying, Hey, dude, get off of him. Get him up. He can't breathe. Now, I had a question. Was there more to this? Is there more to this case than meets the eye? Is there more to this than the domination over Mr. Floyd? Was it more than power and control? Hi! Editing Mama, how are you doing? That's just a little message for later. Hey, Mama, what are you doing? Okay. You better be. Okay. okay, here's my question. Was there more to this than meets the eye? What I mean by that, is this more than the domination, power, and control that this officer had at his disposal? bordering on possible racism or an actual grudge. I mean, I don't know if it's as deep as that, but who knows, right? Because they did work. Mr. Floyd and Chauvin, they had worked at, as security at a Latin club. And they worked the same shift. I mean, yeah, granted, Floyd was inside the club, and Chauvin was supposed to be outside the club in his patrol car, which I found weird. Um, I lost my flow. But Floyd was inside, and Chauvin was outside in his patrol car. I mean, did he have clearance for that? Did he have clearance to be there? In his police car, moonlighting as a security guard. But he would only come in the club when someone sent him out there to, you know, help kick somebody out. Sorry for all the noise in the background. We've got a lot of people walking around. Was this more than to go to the links and in public to torture somebody in front of a crowd of your own citizens you swore to protect which now need to be protected from the police the ones that are paid to serve and protect right now that protection in America is suicide especially to the, the community of it's especially suicidal to be paying your taxes 
for the police to come and serve and protect you in your own neighborhood if you are a person of color. No matter what your status is in that. doesn't matter if you are a doctor or a maintenance worker. A lot of people just treat you like you're nothing because of your skin color. I don't think it's right. The rookies on the job, Lane and Coon, had been on the job as full-fledged, full-time officers for mere days. No matter, their humanity and their morals were absent that day. I understand being conflicted about sidestepping or questioning somebody's authority. In the moment, or in the moment, but ultimately there is a right and a wrong, life or death, in the police's cases, and this one in particular. This didn't happen very quickly, where mere moments happen, I wrote this, this didn't happen very quickly, where mere moments happen in literal seconds. You know that whole... It went so fast, I didn't have a time to think. No, this, this was a painfully long amount of time. Eight minutes and 46 seconds. That's the video uh, that Miss Fraser shot. Eight minutes is not a, oh, it was too quick, I couldn't think. No, you had time, you had opportunity to stop it. Mr. Floyd was laid to rest next to his mother down in Houston. Floyd had stated that he had wanted to touch the world. And he has. His death at the hands of the police ripped open a wound in America that is so deep it never seems to be able to heal. All of the racism and all of the abuse of authority black people of color have to endure in day in and day out. They have to deal with this abuse of authority, of this oppression day in and day out. And they are, there, there are way, way too many instances of police using excessive force for minor offenses. Or even incidences that they either make or make worse. The protest and the riots just exploded because of a perfect storm. You already had a whole bunch of people that were financially insecure. The protest and the riots just exploded because of a perfect storm. What do I mean? With the closures of businesses due to a pandemic which aggravated already stressed financial situations, it was just a matter of time before the stresses erupted and mass chaos ensued. When people are financially insecure or food insecure, it's just a matter of time before that stress erupts in a very, very negative way. Days before May 25th, I had, I had told my family, if people can't get their basic needs met, it will lead to mass panic. What I was thinking was going to happen is, with the virus keep on going, and with the government's lack of motivation to help out their citizens, I mean, yeah, they gave one stimulus check, but a lot of people have been out of work going on three to four months now with no money coming in except for perhaps twelve hundred dollars in some cases I, mean, I, mean, I just thought it was going to be a goods or a food shortage i never would have guessed it would be because of a video showing what the police have done time and time again to people of color i never thought it would be a video of torture and murder by the police in public, in the daylight, in front of a crowd where at least one would be filming it. Everybody has a camera nowadays. There's cameras everywhere. I mean, not only CCTV, but everybody that has a cell phone has a camera. People need to be more aware of everything. 
and just thought, just don't do shit like this. And just don't do it. Never did I think anyone that wore that badge would be so callous, so brazen, and so very cruel. Boy, was I naive. Now, I am, I got her the full statement of, of a video by this lady. I mean, it, it, it's a very powerful video. Her speech is very, very powerful. And it really, really, really. I mean, she passionately and eloquently and unapologetically is in your face with her knowledge of economics and oppression of black Americans. Everybody needs to go and find the Kimberly Jones video and watch it. I mean, actually watch it and listen to it. Hear her message. I mean, she said that there's, there's instances in history where black Americans were to create their own community and pull themselves up by their bootstraps becomes a successful, peaceful community. And white people come and they burn it down. They destroy it. Then they reap the rewards by claiming the land. Uh, the video titled, How Can We Win? Um, I will, I will find the link and I'll put it in my description boxes, both on, on my podcast and on YouTube. Because I do upload some of these on YouTube. Nothing special. I got like two subscribers. I don't care though. Because this needs to be talked about. This needs to be talked about. And people need to be aware of what is happening to our citizens. And, and we all need to be equally angry. And fight for a change. Because this should have, this should have already been changed. This, I might make a, I might make a recording of it and maybe insert it later, but I don't know. I will not do justice to her. I've got her full statement here. That's what I'm, I mean, I originally saw uh, her whole statement as I watched uh, one of the last week tonight with John Oliver, his episode. And even though I thought I had an idea of that struggle, no, I won't even pretend to. And privilege? Yeah, that's a thing. That's a thing. Yeah, white people have privilege. I mean, I grew up poor. I grew up dirt poor. And my dad had many run-ins with the local police. I mean, it was so bad they were on a first-name basis with you know, my dad and the jailer. Just not friendly either way. I mean, my dad was a great guy overall. He had his problems with alcohol. I mean, when he would drink liquor, it would just amplify every negative thing about him. And... I mean, he was discriminated about because of that, but they kind of had a reason to because of all the crap he would pull. Okay, I am going to read this. This is from care11.com. Because I said I wanted to do a proper, a memoriam. For Mr. Floyd, and I did not write this, I'm going to read it, or at least include the direct link to the article. For George Floyd, A Complicated Life and a Notorious Death. Through the people who knew him, these are some of the stories that painted George Floyd's 46 years of life. Years before a bystander's video of George Floyd's last moment turned his name into a global cry for justice, Floyd trained a camera on himself. I just want to speak to you all real quick, Floyd says in one video, addressing the young men in his neighborhood who looked up to him. 
His six foot seven frame crowds the picture. I've got my shortcomings and my flaws, and I ain't better than nobody else, he says. But man, the shooting's going on. I don't care what hood you're from, where you're at, man. I love you. God loves you. Put them guns down. At the time, Floyd was respected as a man who spoke from hard, but hardly extraordinary experience. He had nothing remotely like the stature he had gained in death, embraced as a universal symbol for the need to overhaul policing and held up as a heroic everyman. But the reality of his 46 years on earth, including sharp edges and setbacks, Floyd himself acknowledged, was both much fuller and more complicated. Once a star athlete with dreams of turning pro and enough talent to win a partial scholarship, Floyd returned home only to bounce between jobs before serving nearly five years in prison. Intensely proud of his roots in Houston's Third Ward and admired as a mentor in, in a public housing project beset by poverty. He decided the only way forward was to leave it behind. He had made some mistakes that cost him some years of his life, said Ronnie Lillard, a friend and rapper who performs under the name Reconcile. And when he got out of that, I think the Lord greatly impacted his heart. Floyd was born in North Carolina, but his mother, a single parent, moved the family to Houston when he was two, so she could search for work. They settled in the Cooney Homes, a low-slung warren of more than 500 apartments south of downtown, nicknamed the Bricks. The neighborhood for decades, a cornerstone of Houston's black community, has gentrified in recent years. Texas Southern University, a historically black campus directly across the street from the projects, has long held itself out as a launch pad for those willing to strive. But many residents struggle, with incomes about half the city's average and unemployment nearly four times higher even before the recent economic collapse. Yura Hall, who grew up next door to Floyd, said even in the third ward, other kids looked down on those living in public housing. To deflect the teasing, he, Floyd, and other boys made up a song about themselves. I don't want to grow up. I'm a Cooney Combs kid. They're n they've got so many rats and roaches I can play with. Side note, I just assumed it would be like to the Toys R Us jingle. It's not specified in this article. It would be, you know. Larsena Floyd invested her hopes and her son, who as a second grader wrote that he dreamed of becoming a U.S. Supreme Court Justice. She thought he would be the one that would bring them out of poverty and struggle, said Travis Keynes, a longtime friend. Floyd was a star tight end for the football team at Jack Yates High School playing for the losing side in 1992 state championship game at Texas Memorial Stadium in Austin. He was an atypical football player. We used to call him Big Friendly, said Sir Vance Williams, a former teammate. Side note again. I'm terrible at pronouncing certain names. And I do not mean anybody disrespect when it comes to me mispronouncing people's names or cities or con or countries or state, you know. You know, I'm just 
I mean, heck, my first name is Holly. How vanilla can you get? Okay, on to the article. If you said something to him, his head would drop, said Maurice McGowan, his football coach. He just wasn't going to ball up and act like he wanted to fight you. On the basketball court, Floyd's height and strength won attention from George Walker, a former assistant coach at the University of Houston, hired for head job at what is now South Florida State College. The school was a 17-hour drive away in a small town, but high school administrators and Floyd's mother urged him to go, Walker said. They wanted George to really get out of the neighborhood, to do something, be something, Walker said. In Avon Park, Florida, Floyd and a few other players from Houston stood out for their size, accent, and city cool. They lived in the Jerconda Hotel, a historic lodge used as a dormitory, and were known as the Jack Boys. He was always telling me about the third ward of Houston, how rough it was, but how he loved it, said Robert Caldwell, a friend and fellow student who frequently traveled with the basketball team. He said people know how to grind as hard as it is. People know how to love. After two years in Avon Park, Floyd spent a year at Texas A&M University in Kingsville before returning to Houston and his mother's apartment to find jobs in construction and security. Larcina Floyd, known throughout the neighborhood as Miss Sissy, welcomed her son's friends from childhood, offering their apartment as a refuge when their lives grew stressful. When a neighbor went to prison on drug charges, Miss Sissy took in the woman's preteen son, Cal, Cal Wayne, deputizing George to play older brother for the next two and a half years. We would steal his jerseys and put his jerseys on and run around the house, go outside, Jerseys all the way down to our ankles because he was so big and we were so little, said Wayne, now a well-known rapper who credits Floyd with encouraging him to pursue music. George Floyd, he said, was like a superhero. Floyd, too, dabbled in music, occasionally invited to rap with Earl Davis Jr., better known as DJ Screw whose mixtapes had since been recognized as influential in charting Houston's third in charting Houston's place as a hotbed of hip hop. By then the man known throughout Cooney as Big Floyd started finding trouble. Between nineteen ninety seven and two thousand five Floyd was arrested several times on drug and theft charges, spending months in jail. Around that time, Wayne's mother, Sheila Masters, recalled running into Floyd in the street and learning he was homeless. He's so tall he'd pet me on the head and say, Mama, you know it's going to be all right, Masters said. In August 2007, Floyd was arrested and charged with aggravated robbery with a deadly weapon. Investigators said he and five other men barged into a woman's apartment and Floyd pushed a pistol into her abdomen before searching for items to steal. Floyd pled guilty in 2009. He was sentenced to five years in prison. By the time he was paroled in January of 2013, he was nearly 40. He came home with his head on right, said friend Travis Keynes. At a Christian rap concert in the Third Ward, Floyd met Lillard and Pastor Patrick P.T. Nigualo, whose friends, whose ministry was looking for ways to reach residents in Cooney Homes.
Floyd, who seems to know everyone in the project, volunteered to be their guide. Soon Floyd was setting up a wash tub on the Cooney basketball courts for baptisms for New Gualo's newly formed Resurrection Houston congregation. He joined three-on-three -three basketball tournaments and barbecues organized by the ministry. He knocked on doors with New Gualo, introducing residents as candidates for grocery deliveries or Bible study. Another pastor Christopher Johnson recalled Floyd stopping by his office while Johnson's mother was visiting. Decades had passed since Johnson's mother had, had been a teacher at Floyd's high school. It didn't matter. He wrapped her in a bear hug. I don't think he ever thought of himself as being big, Johnson said. There was a lot of big dudes here. He was a gentleman and a diplomat, and I'm not putting any sauce on it. On the streets of Cooney, Floyd was increasingly on the streets of Cooney, Floyd was increasingly embraced as an OG, literally original gangster, but bestowed as a title of respect for a mentor who'd learned from life experience. In Tiffany Cofield's classroom at a neighborhood charter school, some of her male students, many of whom had already had brushes with the law, told her to talk to Big Floyd if she wanted to understand. Floyd would listen patiently as she voiced her frustrations with students' bad behavior, she said, and he would try to explain the life of a young man in the projects. After school, Floyd often met up with her students outside a corner store. How's school going, he'd ask. Are you being respectful? Are you, how's your mom? How's your grandma? In 2014, Floyd began exploring the possibility of leaving the neighborhood. As a father of five children from several relationships, he had bills to pay. And despite his stature in Cooney, everyday life could be trying. More than once, Floyd ended up in handcuffs when police came through the projects and detained a larger number of men, Cofield said. He would show by example, yes officer, no officer, very respectful, very calm tone, she said. A friend of Floyd's had already moved to the Twin Cities as a part of a church discipleship program that offered men a route to self-sufficiency by changing their environment and helping them find jobs. He began looking to start fresh, a new beginning, said Christopher Harris, who preceded Floyd to Minneapolis. Friends provided Floyd with money and clothing to ease the transition. In Minneapolis, Floyd found a job as a security guard in the Salvation Army's Harbor Light Center, the city's largest homeless shelter. He would regularly walk a couple of female co-workers out at night and make sure they got to their car safely and securely, said Brian Mahollan, director of development for the Army's Minnesota office. Just a big, strong guy with a very tender side. Floyd left a little over a year training to drive trucks while working as a bouncer at a club called Conga Latin Bistro. Side note, I read somewhere he also was working somewhere else as well. I'll look that up and get back to you. He would dance badly to make people laugh, said the owner, Giovanni Turnstrom. I tried to teach him how to dance because he loved Latin music, but I couldn't because he was too tall for me. Floyd kept his connection to Houston regularly returning to Cooney. When Houston hosted the Super Bowl in 2017, Floyd was back in town, hosting a party at the church with music and free AIDS testing. He came back again for his mother's funeral the next year. And when Kane spoke with him last, a few weeks ago, Floyd was planning another trip for the summer. By then, Floyd's was, 
Floyd was out of work. Early this spring, Toonstrom cut Floyd's job when the COVID-19 pandemic forced the club to close. On the evening of Memorial Day, Floyd was with two others when the convenience store employees accused him of paying for cigarettes with a counterfeit 20. Then called the police less than an hour later, Floyd breathed his last. Those who knew him searched for meaning in his death. I've come to the belief that he was chosen, said Caulfield, the teacher. Only this could have happened to him because of who he was and the amount of love that he had for other people. People had for him. In a small comfort, she admits, but then in Big Floyd's neighborhood, people have long made do with less. Merchant and Lorenzo reported from Houston, Haino from Hershey, Pennsylvania, and Geller from New York. Associated Press writer Aaron Morrison in New in Minneapolis and videographer John Malone Moan, I guess, in Houston contributed to the report. That was the care eleven dot com news article. I'm still gonna try to find that Atlanta Journal Constitution that newspaper article. Floyd leaves behind a six-year-old daughter who lives in Houston with her mother, Roxy Washington, at a Minneapolis press conference on June 2, 2020. I want justice for him because he was a good man, and this is proof that he was a good man, she pointed at their six-year-old daughter, Gianna. The way he died was senseless. He begged for his life. When you try so hard to put faith in the system, a system that you know isn't designed for you, when you constantly seek justice by lawful means and you can't get it, you begin to take the law into your own hands. Yeah, that's where uh, Miss uh, Maya Santa Maria worked at. So that's the place that Giovanni ran the bistro and Maya Santa Maria ran the Latin club that it was rumored that Chauvin and Mr. Floyd worked at the same place on the same night. I'm, I don't know if that's true now. I read today, actually, that nobody knows for sure if that now, if they actually cross paths because the guy that said that they had butted heads on occasion, now he's retracting it, saying that he don't know for a hundred percent fact that it was Mr. Floyd that Chauvin had butted heads with. He don't know who actually did that. So I don't know why he said it to begin with. Maybe for the shock value, something to talk about. I don't know. Floyd was always referred to as always cheerful. You know, just a friendly guy and... Then Chauvin, they, the people at the, at the club, they stated that he was okay with the, um, the other employees, but it was the patrons, especially the, the people of color, those patrons, mostly the black patrons, he had a problem with. Now that's all alleged. I don't know. I wasn't there. It's just something I read and I don't want to put out information that's not a hundred percent 
verified. So that as as well as if he actually knew George, you know, definitively or not, I don't know. I really don't know. If they didn't know each other and he never saw him before, that's also got to say something to that guy's character that he would just go and and just have no regard for another person's life. I mean, I, I am baffled on that. How somebody could just disregard somebody else's life. I don't know. I guess I'm naive that way. When I was growing up, my certain members of my family had a very narrow view on a lot of things. They did. They had a very narrow view. And then I'm like, uh, that's not right. Why are you doing that? So you don't always have to follow in your parents' footsteps if you know in your heart is wrong. Accountability, people. Accountability. Take account ability of yourself. I mean, come on. This just always troubled me. That nobody wants to be accountable for their own action. They have to blame everybody else under the sun. Yes, I understand that certain things are a learned trait that you... Once you see it over and over and over again. But I'm living proof that even though your parents or somebody in your family is racist, you don't have to be. You don't have to be. There is not a single race or a single person on this planet that is better than another person. I don't care. I do not care financially, racially, whether it's your religion, whether you have a religion or not, doesn't matter what color your skin is. It doesn't matter how much money you have in the bank. There is not a single person in my view that is better than another person. I know that's not popular opinion. That's just mine. And everybody needs to start thinking for themselves and not just feed into the echo chamber online and just talk to people that agree with you. Talk to people that actually you don't agree with, but not in an argumentative way. We should learn something from somebody else, even if you don't always agree with them. If there has been, if there is more open minds out there, that would just like to listen to the other side, actually hear them, I think that is the step, the first step to a better world. That you don't always disregard somebody else's opinion just because it don't line up with your beliefs and that it's your way or the highway. I mean, people, they say that God gave you free will. Use it. Use it and think for yourself. If you actually honestly believe that, think for yourself. Okay. I've been Holly. This has been the Southern Storyteller. And maybe I'm done with this episode. I don't know because there is other topics I would like to explore. This is a very important one. So I did not want to just, hey, this is what happened. A lot of stuff has happened. A lot of stuff has happened. And every single person matters. Black lives matter. Y'all have a good one. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. It's free. There's uh, creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. 
Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcast, and many, many more. You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listen- listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast, and it's all in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. It's really easy, and you're going to have a blast making your own podcast. Join me on Twitter to discuss this case as well as any other true crime case or cryptid, urban legend. Join me over there at Southern Mystery. The O in Southern is a zero at Southern Mysteries on Twitter.